Matthew chapter 6, continuing in what's called the Lord's Prayer, and really it's an example on how to pray. And this morning, I'm going to, I, 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 I'm so terrible at entitling my sermons or giving you the title of the sermons. I ought to do that, and I'll try and do that. Today, it's called Debt Forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with, beginning with verse 9. And then we're going to read through verse 15. Begin with verse 9. But after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. But before we begin, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you today because we are needful people. We need thy grace. We need your mercy. We need the forgiveness of sin. We need hearts cleansed. We need our mouths uh, 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 to be pure and our minds to be focused upon thee. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts and in our lives today, that you would move us uh, in ways that, that uh, are by thy spirit. You might come to understand that what forgiveness is truly experience it. Father, we thank you for grace. In the Son's name, amen. I, I had my sermon all outlined, but I decided I'm going to go to the end of my sermon and begin there. So, uh, I'm doing this for a particular reason, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but uh, we've now come to the second of three requests that relates to men here on earth. We saw, first of all, it was, forgive us, or, or, or it says, give us this day our daily bread. And we dealt with that last week. And this week it says to, that we are to forgive, we're to ask the Lord to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Not just as men, but as the children of God. And the request is that we should make... Uh, this is something that God has to us, is instructing us to make part of our prayer life, is seeking forgiveness. I mean, the, the person who doesn't believe ought to come to God and fall down and ask for forgiveness, should he not? And then, but God says, we are to ask for forgiveness, forgive us our debts. And, and to, to, now we preach grace here. I already said that today. But we preach grace here. We believe that in the election of God and the, and, the, and the work of Christ on Calvary, that he paid our sin debt, who are those who are in Christ. And so our sin is already forgiven. It's already been cleansed. And we don't need to do anything to get it cleansed, right? We don't, because that was the work of Christ. So then why do we need to ask God to forgive us our sins? And this is something that, that sometimes we think about, and I have thought about before. But we need to deal with these and, and, and look at this, so I'm going to do this today. I also want you to note that forgiveness stands next to love as a hallmark of the Christian faith. There is love, we are to love one another, but then there is forgiveness. These two must go together. Alexia, please put that away now. It, we uh, now the word hallmark is a is from the British from the and it stand and, and it's a stamp that was placed on silver, gold, and platinum for proof of a standard of quality. In other words, it was if it was ninety nine point nine percent pure, they stamped it, and that stamp was called a hallmark. It was a standard to which that gold, silver, and platinum actually met. So forgiveness is a hallmark of the Christian faith and is an evidence of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we forgive shows that we love the Lord Jesus. 
Forgiveness flows out of love, and there could be no greater example than our Lord's love for his people. It is because he loved them that he died for their sin, redeemed them to himself, and forgave them all their sin, because he loved us. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he told them in the next verse, it says, You are my friends, is what he told the disciples. So he gave his life for his friends. And in John chapter 5, verse, or Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 8, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Are we not ungodly? Are we not found among the ungodly? But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, while we were in this weakened condition, and that we were sinners, Christ died for us. This shows his great love, and his love was manifested toward us, in that he loved us. And then in Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In whom we have redemption, to be redeemed or bought back through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. You see, it's by grace, by, is, which is by which forgiveness comes. We can receive no forgiveness except to come by grace, and that grace through the blood of the Lord Jesus. And so this brings us to our subject for this morning, which says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or as it's recorded for us in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, And forgive us our sins, for we also Everyone, forgive everyone that is indebted to us. So, debt, the word debt and sins can be interchanged. Forgive us our sins. Now, I said I wanted to go and deal with my last point before I go through the rest of the sermon. And I want to deal with this, which is both verse 14 and 15. He says, and this is kind of a, like an addendum that he put at the end of the prayer to go back, I believe, to, to verse 13. He says, for if ye forgive, if, for if ye, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. The reason why I wanted to deal with this, you've got to remember who Jesus was speaking to. He's speaking to Jews. The Jews are very hard people when it comes to forgiving. It was taught in the law by the Pharisees. Forgiveness was not in the, the mouth of the Pharisees. They taught the people an eye for an eye. Revenge is, is sweet, basically. That, that um, um, you needed to get even. You had a right to get even. Not just a right, but a duty to get even. In other words, nobody's allowed to get away with anything. If you, if somebody offended, you have a right to get even with them. And revenge for a wrong was actually expected and required. The, the, the Pharisees made a point to teach that you had a right to get right. <laughs> even if there's an accident. Now, this is taught in the law, too. So, uh, uh, I'm not misteaching the law, but according to the law, if a man, even if he accidentally kills one of the members of your family, then the family has a right to appoint the avenger of blood who has a right to go out and seek your life and to take it as well. Even Stephen, right? You took his life, we're going to take your life. And the Lord provided for that with cities of refuge so that the, man, the person who slays a man accidentally can go to such a place and be safe and free from, from the avenger of life. That, so he wouldn't lose it. But you, but that would be accidental death. So we won't get into all that. That's, a, that's another study for another time. But please note with me, when it says here in verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. This is not teaching that your acts of forgiveness give merits to God's forgiveness of you. In other words, just because you're forgiving other people, that isn't going to give you credit towards God for your own sin. It's not what it's teaching here. And we need to get clear and understand that. 
The forgiveness of sin is, our, our sin is based upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and its application upon us. But what it is teaching is an unforgiving spirit may manifest that you're not a child of God. If you are, if you will not forgive that one which is your brother, then what makes you think you're a child of God and, and going to receive the, the forgiveness of God? An unforgiving spirit may cause God also to withhold from you blessings and your and the sense of your own forgiveness. We want to know that we're forgiven of sin. We want uh, when we stand. I'll get into this a little later, but we want to know our sins are forgiven us and that are not held against us. And we may lose that sense of forgiveness if we don't forgive those who trespass or sin against us. The free grace of the love of God may become obscure to us because we're not forgiving another that has sinned against God or sinned against us. And Psalm 68, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you have iniquity in your heart, what makes you think that the Lord's going to hear you? He's going to withdraw himself, his presence from you. And in John 9, 31 it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he heareth them. So when you continue in sin, you cannot expect God to hear you. If men who are uh, who are on equal foot with one another, because men are men, and I mean mankind, we're human beings. If we are on foot with one another uh, of equal, equal, being humans, sh should not we forgive one another? And how should we be expected that our Father which is in heaven, who is so much more and above us, Be obliged to forgive us. We cannot even forgive one another. How can we expect God who is so much greater than us forgive us of our trespasses? How miserable we would be if we did not forgive one another. I just wanted to touch on that. I, uh, before I move into the actual message here on this forgiveness. I just want to touch on that. We are to be forgiving people. But as we look at this, there are two parts to the request. First, regarding the forgiveness of our debt owed to God. And then, the second is the debt owed to us by our fellow man. There's two offenses going on. Our offenses and our sins and our indebtedness to God, and then those that sin against God us. We can be sinned against. We certainly can, and we are often. And we're going to look at that too. So there are two things, and we're going to examine both these uh, this morning. First of all, the debt owed to God. Forgive us our debts as we forgive them who, who are, uh, who, uh, for, if we forgive our debtors. We're in debt. We owe. <laughs> We sing that little song, we owe, we owe, so off the work we go, right? <laughs> the form of that debt. We often don't think of ourselves in terms of owing God. We don't. We don't think that we owe God anything a lot of times. We think that we owe Him nothing. I mean, after all, He's God. What can we give Him? God needs nothing. Not a thing. That God does not need us. He doesn't need our praise. He doesn't need our homage. He doesn't need our money or anything that we think or anything we own. We can't add to God. All things belong to God anyways, and He already knows all things, so we can't help Him out at all. In fact, the Bible says, Who hath been His counselor? Who hath instructed God? None has. And He is self-sufficient, self-existing, complete in Himself. He needs nothing of us or from us. He is complete in Himself, and that we are the work of His creative will. We exist because God created us. Because it was God's purpose to do so. Now, uh, for His glory and for His praise, and Adam was created 
in perfect moral uprightness. We think about upright men, but none were as upright as Adam. He was created in moral uprightness. He was without any taint or evidence of sin, nor of the will of sin. Now, Adam was created with what we would call a free will. A free will is one that, ha that is a will that has no, uh, think if I can think of the word that I want to put with it, no impulse to act one way or another. He is free to choose how he is to, to how he desires to act or to do uh, what, he, what he wills to do. He had a free will. It wasn't bound up in sin as ours is today. Um, and God only gave Adam one commandment. God gave Adam one commandment. That's it. Simple one. And you, uh, it said God gave him one commandment that is not to eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden and the terms were laid before him that if he ate of that tree, he would surely die. That's all the terms was. Don't eat, because if you eat, you'll die. You say, hey, that sounds easy enough. I wouldn't have done it, right? <laughs> no, you would have. Just like Adam did, so would you. You would have done the very same thing. And if you deny that, then I'm going to tell you, that God says, let every man be a liar and God be true. Because you've lied. <laughs> it's, it's just our nature. E even in this one command, Adam disobeyed. He fell from that happy and holy state in which he was created. And he died spiritually. And his body began to decay. And his will became captive to sin. It's what we call depravity. In a theological term, it's called depravity. We became depraved. So that only our will now is our will now is captive in sin. We desire to do sin. That's just the way we are now. Adam being the progenitor of the entire human race caused all of his pros, pros, not prosperity, posterity, all of his people, all the people that came down from Adam, their, his posterity was born in sin and in sin continuously that's that's the way we have we have a nature now that has caused us to sin we're all born in depravity all our sinners all are under just condemnation in romans chapter 5 verse 12 says wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and, and death by sin because he said when, when you sin you will die and so man uh, so he says that sin entered into the world and death by sin. So that death was passed upon all men. Uh, for all have sinned. All have sin sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. There is no person on this earth that has not sinned. Now because of one, because of one sin, all men are born with a sin nature and a propensity to sin continuously. A sin nature. A nature is what we do because it is natural to us to do it. Dogs bark because it is in their nature to bark. That's what they do unless you have a barkless dog. And there is such a, a Basenji dog as a barkless dog. But, but I'm going to tell you something. You know why they don't bark? Because it's in their nature. It's in their nature. Birds fly. But not all birds fly. Right? The ostrich and the emu don't fly. And neither do penguins. But they do what they do because it's their nature to do it. We do what is in our nature to do, and that is to sin. It is natural for us to sin. And we are thoroughly corrupt, so much so that the Bible says that in this flesh dwelleth no good 
thing. Nothing is any good in our flesh. We are full of iniquity. We are full of vile corruption. That is our nature. Now, can men do good things on this earth? Of course they can. And we do do good things, don't we? There are many people give to charity. There's people who help other people out. But what is that in relationship to God? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about man-to-man -man relationships. We're talking about man's relationship to God. And before God, all men are sinners. He says that even in the, the plowing of the wicked is sin. The man who goes out into his field and plows a crop is sinning against God. He's sinning because he gives no glory to God for the rain that falls and the sun that comes down and the crop that, that grows up, nor the harvest. And he gives no glory to God, so he sins even in plowing his field. That's how corrupt we are. Now, the extent of that debt. We all men are sinners. We know that. And that, that debt is owed for our failure of obedience to God's law. We have not, we, we have not, and we cannot obey the laws of God. And He give us those laws. We owe God our obedience by virtue of our creation. God is owed. He is owed our obedience by virtue of our creation and being a created being of, uh, from Him that we need, um, oh, he owes, we owe to Him our obedience. But what? We're full of sin. Here's the real problem. Because of our depraved nature, we literally hate God and are rebels against God because our hearts are not inclined to worship and love God. That's a natural condition. We hate His loss. We don't want to be obedient to His loss. We want to do what we want to do, not what God wants us to do. And that's so very true. Our debt is so great that, that we cannot pay. God does not have a payment plan. It is owed, and it is owed now. That's the, the, the man's at the door knocking to collect the bill. How do I know that? John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That is a present tense. If we learn anything about English, we'll learn that that means right now that that wrath abides upon us. It is due now. It's like the man who is sitting on death row. He has been sentenced to death. He is going to the electric chair, the gas chamber, or to lethal injection, or, or hanging, or whatever the method is. He is on death row. He's waiting for that sentence to be uh, uh, filled by his death. And so is every man that is alive today up to the point of that judgment. He is on death row waiting. He is under the wrath and condemnation of God. Now this sentence of condemnation, this wrath of God presently abides on those who do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, the Bible says on, and there's a good reason. Because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is believing and placing yourself upon Him and, and having faith in Him. Just believing in, in Jesus. There's a lot of people who believe in Jesus, believes in the facts of Jesus. You can believe a lot of facts, and you can read a lot of facts in the Bible and say, yeah, I believe that about Jesus. But that's not the same as believing on the Lord Jesus. You can believe in all day and go to hell. But you must believe on the Lord Jesus. A second problem with our nature is that we have no ability in ourselves to change our nature. Can a leopard change his spots? The scriptures say. Can a man add a cubit, cubit to his height? Approximately 18 inches. Can you just... Uh, just decide upon yourself that you're going to grow an extra 18 inches? I know there's a lot of people who wish they could. No, because it's not in nature to do so. That is the problem. Some might plead with us to repent, or we might be warned uh, with great earnestness to turn, to, to turn or suffer eternal wrath. We, 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 but we will not heed will not do it. 
because we're both deaf and blind by sin to heed such a warning. We could cry out, turn ye, turn ye, but ye will not turn because it is not your nature to hear and or nor are you able to see the danger that is in front of you. What did Jesus say to, the, to those Jewish people? He says, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. But as 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are... I'm sorry, that's 1 Corinthians 2.14. says, But the natural man receiveth not the, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them, or unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, spiritual things to the natural man are foolishness. You're a fool if you believe in Christ. You're an idiot if you believe the Bible. I mean, what? Well, you just need Jesus for some kind of a crutch in your life. That's what they say, isn't it? So they're foolishness to him, and he can't know them because they are spiritually discerned. It is a spiritual issue, and when men are dead and trespassed and sins, they cannot see anything spiritual. It is God that must open the eyes and take away the deafness of the heart and change their heart of stone into a heart of flesh. It is God that must do that. That is the extent of the debt. But now there's the debt that is paid. First of all, in the paying of that debt, there is debt transfer. Debt transfer. Actually, if you took up your picked up a dollar bill, it says at the top of the dollar bill, Federal Reserve Note. Do you know what a note is? A note is a debt. When we owe a note on a car, it's a debt. When we owe a note on your house, it's a debt. The Federal Reserve Note is a debt. When we give when we pay money, which is not really money, money is supposed to discharge debt. In other words, it's owed, so we actually pay silver or gold, pay for the debt. When you give them a Federal Reserve note, all you have done is transferred the debt from one to another. You haven't paid for anything. Now, you'll have to study economics a little bit more to learn that. I'm just giving you a basic fact. You have transferred the debt. You have not actually paid for it. So when you pay for your house, you haven't actually paid for it. You've only transferred the debt. Now, there is a transfer of debt that is real with a genuine payment made on behalf of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have been saved. The debt transferred, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The, the, in other words, the debt that we have, our sin, was actually transferred to Christ, because He knew no sin, and our sin was transferred to Him, and guess what was transferred to us? His righteousness. His righteousness was put on the account, and that's what the word transfer means, or... or, or uh, uh, indebtedness, uh, um, impu imputation, that's the word I'm looking for. Imputation or imputing is a, a term of, of uh, his righteousness. And so he became sin for us who knew no sin. And then in Psalm 32, 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is he on whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed unto the, is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. God imputes to us our, His righteousness, but He does not impute to us our sin because Christ died for our sin. The debt's paid. He's paid for His people. He's paid for all those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was our debt transferred to Christ, but it was also paid in full by Him. Whatsoever was owed to the law was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't owe 
because it was paid for by the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And I was, who can charge any of the elect of God with sin? It is God that justifies or declares righteous. Who, who is he that condemneth? In other words, there's condemnation for those who are under the law, for those who have sinned against God. They stand condemned. But for whom Christ died, it says, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, is, yea rather, is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. You see, he died, and he rose again. He died and, and cleansed us and took his sin, our sins upon him, and then he rose again for our justifications. It says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. And in, in chapter 8, 1 and 2 of Romans says, There is therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I can't say anything better than what the Scriptures have said. The debt was paid. The debt was paid by Christ. And forgiveness because of that debt. Or because of that, for, uh, 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 because the debt was paid, we have forgiveness. Ephesians 1 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It's because of grace, as I've already said. In Colossians 1 13 and 14, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Because that's what we were under. We were under the power of darkness. If we're not in Christ, we're under the power of darkness and, and have translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have that because Christ died for sin and sinful men. Our debt of sin can never be brought against us to condemn us. In fact, before God, our sin is fully discharged. There are no charges against us. There is no condemnation because it has been fully discharged based upon the work of Christ at Calvary. We have not been justified. We have been justified from all of our offenses. Every one of them. Every one of them in the past. Every one today. All those in the future. This is a judicial declaration. It is a declaration from the judge of the whole earth who says, not guilty. He says, not guilty to all those who believe on the Lord. Just as if, though we've heard the word justified means just as if I never sinned. Absolutely right. You've been pardoned, acquitted, declared not guilty. Now who receives this debt forgiveness? You know there's a lot of people who owe on their credit cards. Right? They're in debt. And unless you go into bankruptcy, you owe the debt. Sometimes you can go to a company and get debt forgiveness. Or not, not a good thing, but you can do that. Nevertheless, you still have the guilt of that debt. Not when it comes to Christ. Who receives this debt forgiveness? The one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believes, they are the ones who receive and have received this forgiveness. The one who believes on the Son of God hath everlasting life. John 3, 36, we read that. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. All others are guilty and under just condemnation, and the wrath of God presently abides on you. Now, The debt owed to us, a fellow man. We can be offended by others, can we not? And we are. As a Christian man, we are, or Christian pe as people who love the Lord, we are constantly offended by the world and by the people of the world. Are we not? We ought to be if, there's, if we don't, there's a problem. 
We're offended by their speech. We're offended by their habits, their attitudes, their actions towards God. Those things that they do that are so offensive to Christ. And they ought to offend us if they offend the Lord, don't you think? But I'm also offended by some of those who are called brethren. I, I am. As James 3, 2 says, for, by many, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in this in the world, the same as a perfect man and able to bridle his whole body. Do you know any perfect men? I don't. And you know what? There are many brethren who offend. Sometimes for the same reasons as I am by the world. In other words, men who profess to be in Christ and they act just like the world. I find that very offensive that they say, well, I'm a Christian, but they act just like a man who's not a Christian. That ought to be very offensive. They profess to love the Lord, but they do those things which are contrary to love, according to the Scripture. And sometimes I'm offended by their lack of understanding of the Word. We ought to be, we ought to be people who believe the Bible. And every word of it, even if we don't like what it says, or we might feel contrary to it. In other words, you know what? There's some things that the Bible says that I don't like. <laughs> A lot of things it says I don't like. You know what? I believe it. And I pray to God that he conforms my own attitude towards what the scriptures teach. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm offended by people who are very uncharitable towards other believers, the way they talk about others. They talk about this man over there or this woman over here. And they, they're, I, I find that offensive. Why are you talking about us? You have nothing to do with them. What are you doing in their business? And it's not your business. You have no business talking about people the way that you talk about people. But so the Bible says, love covereth the multitude of sins. And yes, we're all sinners, but do you want people talking about you the way you talk about somebody else? Or perhaps it's just folks' worldly view in contrast to a scriptural view. I've talked to many who profess things out of God's Word, but you know what? They must never read God's Word because otherwise they would conform themselves to the things of Christ and they wouldn't believe all the worldly things that they hear. Especially if they read the Word of God, they won't do it. It might be because of, we've, of compromise in either doctrine or practice. I know many who profess Christ, but they've compromised the Scriptures for the things of the world. And they've kind of gone, they've gone backwards. But they don't practice things the way the Bible teaches that they're to be practiced. But for whatever reason we can be, that we can think of, uh, we can be sinned against. We can be sinned against. We can be trespassed against. We can, we, we can have people do things we don't like that are wrong. You know what? I even offend myself sometimes. I've had things come out of my mouth that offend me. And thoughts come to my mind which are offensive. Because there's that old nature and there's that new nature and, I, and the things of God. I know that what I've thought or what I have said is contrary to the things of God. And it offends me. I sin against myself. I sin, I, I've sinned against my wife. I know that. I've offended her many times, I'm sure. And then my children, I'm sure I've done that. And grandchildren as well. No doubt I have, I have at some point offended you. Peter brings this question to the Lord, and it would be good for, be for us, good for us to see the answer. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 18 real quick, verse 21. Matthew 18, 21. It says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven? Is that enough times? If my brother comes and he sins against me, how often should I forgive him? You know, is this, is that a reasonable question? How many times do I got to put up with somebody offending me? Then he goes on and says, Jesus said unto him, not unto, this, not unto the, I'm sorry, Jesus said unto him, Say not, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seventy. So are you going to sit there and count 144 times? <coughs> seven times, seven, no, 210 times, isn't it? Seven times 70? I don't know. You can check my math out. My, my, my math. 
<laughs> my mouth and my map is getting all confused here today. And then he gives him a king, a, a parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun, he reckoned one and brought him, which owed him ten thousand talents. In other words, that might as well be a million or two million or three million dollars to any of us. It was an astronomical amount of money. For as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children and all that had, and payment be made. In other words, they were sold into debtor's prison. Get as much as you can out of it. We're not going to get all the money, but we'll get as much as we can and we'll extract it from these folks. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. In other words, a small amount. And he laid his hand on him, and took him by the throat. <laughs> you imagine that? This guy's a bully. This guy's an enforcer. He takes him by the throat. And he says, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and beside him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he shall pay, till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what was done, there was he was there they were very sore, and they came and told it to the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, he said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because as thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him into the, to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise, my heavenly Father, do also unto you, if from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You know what? He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We owe God so much. So much is owed. We cannot possibly pay. It is a small thing that we should forgive one another who are equal to each other of our trespasses and of our sin. In Luke 17, 3 and 4 says, Take heed to yourself, thy uh, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, seven times in a day, turn again to him, to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. We are to forgive our debtors, as God has forgiven us. This is why our Lord makes it a point for us to pray for the forgiveness of sin. Why does he make it a point? Since we are the children, since, since the sin of God's children have been discharged, paid for, and are no longer chargeable with their sin. Because in Romans 8, 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. We do need to pray for the forgiveness of our sin. Because He has done it. One is because we copiously and continuously sin before God. When you were saved, did any of you stop sinning? I'd like to meet the man who did. There, you won't find one. But he's but we're first John 1 8 says, if we have if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All our sin has been forgiven, and we are fully justified by the blood of Christ, but we still sin the sins that were forgiven. He may have forgiven us all sin from from, from birth until death, but we still sin, don't we? We still continuously sin. And we'll continue to sin as long as we're in this flesh. By confessing to God our sins, God gives us the sense of forgiveness or the experience 
of forgiveness. You know what? I need to experience the forgiveness of God. How about you? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why is that? Because of the blood of Christ. He's already done it. He's, always, he's faithful and He's just. And we need to confess our sin. Without the sense of our sins forgiven, we would be crushed under the weight of guilt. We would feel so guilty, we would feel crushed. If we not, if it, when we confess and we admitted our guilt, the real guilt and offenses against the Holy God, if we didn't have the forgiveness of God and feel the forgiveness of God, we would have no assurance of salvation. We would have nothing to say, go oh God, please help me. We'd be in such despair if we didn't know and experience the forgiveness of God. That's why we need to confess so that God will give us the experience of that forgiveness. We need to confess because uh, of the sense of powerlessness in keeping from sin. We cannot help but sin. In this flesh dwelleth no good thing. We cannot help but sin. It is our nature to sin. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We need to ask God for the forgiveness of sin. Because we constantly offend a righteous God, it is appropriate that we seek His forgiveness. And because of the magnitude of the debt, and thus the forgiveness of that debt. Having forgiven us such a great debt, do we not owe God a confession of our sin? There was a, In Luke chapter 7, 41 through 43, it says, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Well, there's between 550, isn't there? There's ten times as much debt with the one than with the other. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Who's going to forgive most? The one that has the greater amount of sin forgiven? The lesser amount. The greater our debt, the greater our, our, our sense of the knowledge of that forgiveness. We confess our sin. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. It is the expression of gratuity for the forgiveness of sin. It is a manifestation and application of the grace of God in the forgiveness of sin. And now that we're directed to do it. We're told to Pray, forgive us our sins. How is it with you today? Do you know the forgiveness of sin? Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? He tells us to pray, our, uh, our Father which art in heaven. And then he says, forgive us our debt or our sin as we forgive our sins. Those who have sinned or trespassed or are dead to us. Those who have sinned against us. You see, to the believer, the believer confesses his sin and repents of his sin. He owes a great debt to God and he is sensible of it. And he wants to experience the forgiveness of God in his life. And so he prays this way. But to the unbeliever... What does it say about them? It says, The wrath of God abideth on you now. And your sins are not forgiven you. We ought to daily, continuously confess our sin to the Father. Forgive us sin against thee. That is a prayer that we're to do. As a, the Lord gives us instruction. You know what? I pray that prayer. I'm just in the prayer closet. I pray it all the time. Because I'm such a sinner. Just a, such a... You know, he uses, us, he uses the term beggarly. 
that we're to be beggarly in our spirit. I don't know about you, but we ought to feel very low, very beggarly before the mighty God. We ought to plead for his forgiveness and thank him that he has forgiven and that he has poured out upon us all of his great and grand benefits, all wrapped up in the simple term, eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. For we certainly are sinners. We are certainly in need of forgiveness. Father, may we both may be confessing our sin and so very willing to forgive others who have trespassed and sinned against us. Might we show that true character of Christ in us. Might we walk in ways that are pleasing unto thee, demonstrating the spirit of Christ in all that we do and all that we say. Help us, Father, to be obedient to the things that we're instructed of. Thy word.